At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce our provost, Dr. Lynette Olson. And I'm not going to read her big long bio to you, but one thing that I do want to tell you that we're very proud that she was our 2014 Pittsburgh Area Chamber of Commerce Woman of Distinction. So we're very proud of her for having that honor. Let's give her a round of applause. And she will introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Olson. What Dietra didn't tell you is that I was among a very special uh, group of women who were recognized that year. So I appreciate you calling that out. That's very nice to hear. Uh, the worst part of that was that my picture was on the calendar uh, one month, and that month they prepared me for uh, a realization that you get lots of notifications from people who would say things like, I'm looking at you. <laughs> So, <laughs> very bizarre, but <laughs> awkward, to say the least. I just want to be among those who welcome you to Pittsburgh State University in Southeast Kansas, and I would guess that there are some in, uh, among us who maybe have not been to this part of the state of Kansas and have not been on the Pittsburgh State campus. And uh, we just want to let you know that we're very, very happy to have you come all the way here. You know, that's the, that's the secret to these journeys. Uh, they always seem so far to where you're going, uh, whatever that going is. So when we come out to Fort Hayes, President Martin, it's going to be a long journey for us. Uh, so there's just that perspective. So uh, we don't take it for granted that you decided to come and be with us these two days. You know, this is a really special event, I think. And I've gone almost every uh, year that I've been a provost. In fact, I think I've gone every year that I've been provost. And I learn something new every uh, meeting, every uh, conference, whether it's through a breakout or through one of the um, uh, keynote presentations or whether it's sitting with colleagues and just talking about what it is we're trying to do. Uh, you know, on a, uh, being on a university or college campus is really a special gift. I'm going to couch it that way tonight. And my goodness, looking at these students on the stage, uh, a display of diversity. Uh, we're very fortunate to be among students who have a, come from a variety of backgrounds and can teach us things. And the same happens as we bring colleagues together, we learn from each other. So I hope you have a fabulous day uh, tomorrow and the rest of this evening. Uh, certainly, being in this, I'm sorry I have to say it because I don't get to say it very often. Usually President Scott is the one who's uh, giving kudos to this building. Uh, but isn't this a, just a fabulous venue for us? We're just under a year of having enjoyed it. And so we still walk into the building and wonder where we are because it's just such a fabulous contribution uh, to our community and our understanding uh, of all aspects of culture and art. As I mentioned, this is a system-wide uh, experience for us, and so I guess I would el also welcome you on behalf of my colleagues, the chief academic officers, uh, in particular of the six state universities. Uh, we believe in this conference. Uh, we want it to be the very best that it can be and really bring and contribute to our work on our campuses. And so tonight, it is a special honor for me uh, to be able to introduce President Myrta Martin from Fort Hayes State University. You know, she hasn't been in the state very long. Uh, she's a new adoptee uh, for the state of Kansas, and uh, we're just thrilled to have her among us and that she could make the journey from Hayes uh, to be with us. She's the ninth president of Fort Hayes State University and really began that uh, last May, 
I believe, so we'll celebrate an anniversary here before too long. She holds a baccalaureate degree in psychology and political science from Duke University, a Master of Business Administration degree from the University of Richmond, and a doctorate with an emphasis in strategic management and leadership from Virginia Commonwealth University. And this is one of the things that is most impressive, although there are many things impressive about her. She is fluent in three foreign languages. Uh, so who knows what language she's going to be speaking to us in this evening. I'm hoping for English. I don't know about you. But. Her career has involved work in both public and private sectors. Uh, she's a, been a tenured faculty member. She's had various administrative positions in a variety of institutions, in private institutions, community colleges, and public universities. So she has a broad understanding of the work of the academy at many, many levels. Uh, she's been, she has been and is active in many organizations and re has received numerous awards. Just going to mention a couple. Uh, she uh, received the Humanitarian Award for Academic Excellence, uh, the Hispanic College Fund Legacy Award, she was a finalist for the Innovation in Education Educator uh, of the Year Award and has been one of the most influential women in Chesterfield County, Virginia. So I have no doubt that as she spends time with us in the state of Kansas, she's going to add to that list as people recognize uh, the great value that she's brought to us. Under her leadership, the Reginald F. Lewis School of Business was named the best business program out of 108 historically black colleges and universities throughout the country by the Center for HBCU Media Advocacy. And I'm saying that for our Dean of Business, uh, for his sake, uh, Paul Grimes, Dr. Paul Grimes, because I knew you'd be impressed with that. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and she's an immigrant to the United States and she uses her interpersonal and cultural expertise uh, to work to promote access to affordable educational opportunities. So I am just so pleased uh, to be able to introduce to you and to our listening uh, today and learning from Dr. Myrta Martin. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for being here. President Scott, Dr. Olson, members of the Tilford Conference Planning Committee, thank you for opening your home to us here uh, this evening and also to all of the invited guests. It's an honor to be here with you all tonight and to share with you a journey, a journey towards excellence, a journey that has brought me to Kansas. Your ears may have already told you that I'm not from these parts. Born, as you heard earlier, in Havana, Cuba. I grew up in Madrid, in Spain, and I immigrated to the United States. A journey like that stays with you your lifetime. It shapes you. It guides your perspective on practically everything. I remember leaving Cuba with my grandmother and my sister with only the clothes on our back. The rest of my family was not allowed to leave the island. When I arrived in Spain, it was the nuns who my family had helped build convents throughout Spain and throughout Cuba that came to the airport to pick us up. And it was in a convent in Madrid that my sister and I grew up for many years. There are so many memories that I have of my life's journey. I remember being hungry. There was no food in Cuba. I remember arriving in the States and the fear that came with not knowing a word of English. How was I able to communicate with others? How could I go to school? I remember going to school full time while also working a 40 hour week and then getting up on a Sunday at about 6 a.m. in the morning to go to mass and then go off to clean houses so that we could put food on our table. 
but I also remember how very happy I was and how very grateful we were to be in a country where sacrifice and hard work opened doors, a country where through education we could achieve everything, we could achieve anything. And in this country, we found individuals who were willing to give us a hand up, not a hand out. My grandmother would never accept that. I found teachers who believed in me so much that they not only guided me in my application process, but actually wrote the check that afforded me the privilege to go to Duke University. That generosity, well, I've never forgotten that. And it's what drives my work at Fort Hay State University. You see, I am living my American dream as the first Hispanic president in the history of this great state of Kansas and the first female president in the 114 year history of Fort Hay State University. Thank you. And so it is now my time. It is now my time to pass it forward. It is now my time to help the next generation of leaders achieve their American dream. I am thankful for all who have welcomed me to my new home at Fort Hay State University and to Kansas. I am thankful to you for your warm welcome tonight. What I'd like to do this evening is to lay out a case for diversity in higher education. And so let's get started. Let's define just what I mean when I speak about diversity. Historically, diversity has been measured in demographics. The number of people of different ethnicity, different gender or sexual orientation found in a given group. And by this definition, we have made some strides towards achieving diversities across the campuses of the United States over the last 40 years. But we have also learned that diversity measured solely by demographics has limits and it does not guarantee inclusion. The diversity that we need, the diversity that allows us to build an innovative and entrepreneurial culture one that differentiates us and creates the very best programs and services on a worldwide scale must include people who reflect a broad spectrum of demographics and people who reflect a broad spectrum of experiences and of ideas. This re-envisioning of diversity creates an institution where very different people are encouraged to contribute their unique perspectives, one that promotes the free exchange of ideas, one that recruits and maximizes talents from all walks of life, and one that fuels and supports high performance. In December 2013, an article in the Harvard Business Review written by Sylvia Ann Hewitt, Melinda Marshall, and Lauren Sheldon of the Center for Talent Innovation identify what they coined two-dimensional diversity. The first diversity dimension incorporates the traditional traits associated with diversity that I've already mentioned. Inheriting traits such as gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. Their study then went on to identify a second dimension of diversity they called acquired diversity. Acquired diversity includes traits that you gain from your experience. For example, things that you learn from your career, from your studies, or from living in different places. What Hewitt, Marshall, and Sheldon found was that companies that possess more than one dimension of diversity outperform and out-innovated those that did not. Global entrepreneur Richard Branson says that his companies intentionally employ people with different backgrounds, with different viewpoints, skills, and personalities. 
The results, according to Branson, are that teams that can spot opportunities, anticipate problems, and innovate solutions. Forbes magazine estimates that only 50 million Americans will be qualified to fill those 123 million positions. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 is around the corner. It's just five years from now. Actually, if you think about it, 2020 is the year that the next freshman class graduates. We have to get going. The imperative to create a more inclusive opportunity and innovative programs has never been greater. Diversity is the key to increasing the numbers of Americans that seek a college degree. If you employ and recruit only those with whom you identify, with whom you, you think in a particular way, from a particular group, from a certain age group or a geographic area, you just don't have access to the insights, the experiences, the worldviews that will allow us, all of us, to reach our growth potential. Let me share with you a quick story. My husband, John, was traveling from Richmond to Phoenix not too long ago. He was with a bunch of high school seniors on their trip to Washington, D.C. Most of these kids had never been out of Arizona. What these kids wanted to see most was not the city, was not Washington, D.C., was not the Capitol, was not the monuments, but they really, 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 really wanted to see were the trees, were the forests, were the green grass. When John went out west, he didn't want to see that. What he wanted to see were the rocks, was the colors of the desert. You see, when they then got together and exchanged information about where they were going, where they were from, what they could see, they realized that there were an awful lot more things that they should see, that they should learn. And it enriched the experiences for both parties. This is but one example of what a geographic diversity at its basic level can add to students, to staff, and to faculty learning. In 2015, this year, for the first time in our nation's history, non-Hispanic white children were the minority in our nation's schools. In Kansas, in cities like Dodge City, Liberal, and Garden City, I understand that the incoming kindergarten class was 85% Hispanic. These children will be our industry's intellectual engines. They have to be. Now I'll rephrase that. They must be educated. Otherwise, the United States will lose its standing in the world. Yes, there will still be one nation consider a superpower, but unless we wake up, it will not be us. It is critical for our state, for our nation's success, that we attract, engage, educate, and graduate all the bright minds of this country across the broadest possible spectrum of ethnicity, of gender, and of experiences. I believe that there is an epidemic sweeping our nation here in the United States, an epidemic where education is no longer a priority. Individuals say it is, but their actions demonstrate otherwise. Many of us would not be in this room were it not for education. I would not be speaking with you tonight were it not for education. We must remind the nation that it is only through education that we will protect, promote, and for provide that American dream for our next generation of leaders. 
If we don't educate the next generation, there will be a void of leadership in our nation, a void like we've never seen before. And we will have no one to blame but ourselves. As for me, I can tell you that I intend to do everything I can to shift that paradigm back to where it belongs, back towards the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of excellence, and that is arrived through education. And I invite you to join me in that quest. Students today need mentors who can guide, empathize, support, and communicate with them effectively. Research shows that they are more likely to associate with organizations that they can identify with and organizations that appreciate and value their differences. They are not as successful in environments that expect them to conform to thinking or learning in a particular way. Our students also need diversity to be culturally prepared for a global workforce. In his inaugural remark last fall, University of Michigan President Mark Shislel said, in today's hyper-connected world, our graduates at some point will be exposed to people and ideas that they find foreign, difficult to understand, or just outright disagreeable. Learning how to engage with such people and worldviews is one of the most essential speeds, one of the most essential skills that educators can teach today. What this means is that for our students to be truly successful, for our universities in Kansas and in this nation to be truly successful, for our industries to be truly successful, what that means is they must employ diverse and talented individuals to connect in a meaningful way with today's students and to provide them with the tools that they need to succeed. There are also so many intrinsic values to diversity for all of our university's communities. The benefits of diversity of expertise are well under understood and form the backbone of all of our university structures. But what about other benefits of diversity that we can bring to our students? Research at Stanford and UCLA has shown diversity changes the way that we think. Let me say that again. Diversity changes the way that we think. When people from different backgrounds, experiences, and opinions are brought together, it forces everyone to prepare better, anticipate dissent, and expect to expend more effort listening to each other. In a nutshell, when we hear opinions from someone who is different from us, it provokes more thought than when it comes from someone who looks or who thinks like us. Diversity jolts us into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity cannot. It simply cannot. The benefits hold true for our faculty. Researchers at Harvard found that diversity appears to lead to higher quality scientific research. Paper written by diverse research teams were found to receive more citations and had higher impact factors than those written by a homogeneous group. Diversity works to promote hard work and creativity, and this in turn drives performance. Stephen Covey has said, strength lies in difference, not in similarities. We need diversity to change, to grow, and to innovate. Last fall, I raised an important question in our campus. I asked, why should a place like this place an emphasis on diversity and inclusiveness? Why should we do that at a university in the middle of Western Kansas? Let me share with you how I answered that question. I said to our campus community, 
Are there any commodities more global than food and energy? Any industries more international than aerospace or healthcare? Are there any communities that would benefit more from reaching new markets, from brand awareness, from worldwide connections that will expand opportunities and create new jobs, from injections of new creative ideas and talented human capital, from experiences that will change the way our children view the world and the way that we view ourselves and they view themselves. The movers and shakers of today's world already recognize the benefits of diversity. Cosmetic giants L'Oreal uses diversity to drive growth and brand awareness all over our globe. They distill their business case for diversity into one simple formula. Diversity plus inclusion equals innovation and success. Diversity plus inclusion equals innovation plus success. Diversity in all its dimension must be found at our core. We must embrace different types of people, people who stand for different things, represent different cultures, different generations, different ideas, and different ways of working. We must see diversity as an imperative, the essential ingredient for innovation, the essential ingredient for growth. IBM executive Ron Glover said, innovation is about looking at complex problems and bringing new ideas to the table. I ask you, isn't that what diversity is all about? With the unprecedented challenges facing the future of higher education, the entrepreneurship and innovation resulting from diversity will differentiate institutions that thrive from those institutions who will no longer survive. Ladies and gentlemen, diversity is no longer a nice to have thing on college campuses. Diversity is a must have imperative. It is an indispensable factor to our success, to our future in Kansas and in our nation. Diversity affords institutions the ability to achieve our dreams. It affords individuals the ability to break the glass ceiling of the status quo. Why? Because diversity, it's all about excellence. And so I invite you on the quest, upward and onward, because the best is yet to be. Thank you for having me here tonight. You're fine. Let's give her another round of applause. Beautiful. On behalf of the statewide committee, we'd like to present you with a little thank you gift thank for you. traveling to Pittsburgh, Kansas to be our speaker. We were so enlightened by your words, and I'm sure that we will all take those words to heart as we go back collectively and do our jobs on our college campuses. Would you all agree? Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, just a few housekeeping things. We will start in the morning with breakfast at 8 a.m. in the Overman Student Center. So if you are not familiar with campus, there is a map, I think, on the back of your program that should lead you there. We've asked that our faculty and staff kind of park a little bit away from the Student Center so that you'll be able to find a place to park. But don't worry about parking tickets because none will be issued tomorrow. So if you do, the only way is do not park in handicapped or in a red zone or on a yellow curb because we can't save you from those, okay? But anywhere else, a blue parking um, permit, orange or brown, you are free and at liberty to park in those places and we'll try and get you as close to the building as possible. 
Um, I think that's it for tonight. Just enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see you all at breakfast in the morning at 8 a.m.